Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness. That is what we have been talking about and thinking about over the last couple of weeks, your goodness and how it changes us, how it shapes us, and how it allows us to be um, something that our world desperately needs, but in something in our world that uh, is surprising, um, high impact, um, stunning, if you will, got all of those things, because we live in a world where as much as we like to talk about being good, people aren't always that good. And so God, today we ask once again we would be able to think about how um, we can flesh out what it is that you have called and created us to be, and to do so in a way that honors you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, this is week three, I think, where we're talking about our secret weapon, which is the goodness of God. Um, we have talked about the fact that there's a biblical definition of goodness that we, we don't always understand. Um, but goodness is, is, is a, in a biblical sense, is power under control. It is God uh, working in us. And we see that in the life of Jesus over and over again. I, I think I used the illustration for you a couple times. I'll use it again. We know that Jesus is good, and yet Jesus is the same Jesus that turned over the temple, or the tables in the temple. He is the same one that drove the money changers out with a whip. Uh, he is the same one that called um, the Pharisees um, uh, a den of vipers. Uh, he is that kind of good. And you say, well, that doesn't sound good. That's because we don't understand biblical goodness. Goodness is grace and, pow um, and power under control. It is that moment where we know that we have at our disposal everything that we need to do what needs to be done in the moment, and we figure out what is the best approach, what is the best way to take it, and to respond in a godly way. When we do, that's good. And so we've looked over the last couple of weeks at a number of things, uh, and today I said we were going to talk, start talking about how do you weaponize your gentleness? How do you weaponize your gentleness in a world where sometimes it seems like it's us versus them? And it does seem that way sometimes. So how do we do that, and how do we do that in a way uh, that honors God? And so that's kind of where we're going to spend our time um, today. Today, uh, we'll go this morning to the Old Testament prophet Elijah. Uh, 1 Kings 18 is where we're going to go. An example of learning gentleness the hard way uh, is in the prophet uh, Elijah. Um, he boldly denounced sin. Uh, he is courageous. He seemed to fear no one. Um, he's called fire down from heaven, puts on a magnificent display of God's power. Um, and then he proceeded to lead a band of men to execute hundreds of pagan, pagan prophets. First Kings, look at verse 18, read verses 36 through 40 out loud to us. First Kings 18, verses 36 through 40. At the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known uh, today that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant, and have done all things, all these things at your command. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you are turning their hearts back again. When it is done, when it's over with, God then moves and Elijah basically wipes out these, these prophets that have come up and, and, and risen against God. Now, this is, this is, so this guy, this guy has got guts. This is a Bible study. I mean, this is a, there's a sermon in there that I have used a number of times. I use it a lot at youth camps. Um, we acted out a little bit. We let the fire fall from heaven. Um, I've done it um, a number of times. Uh, some of you have seen it way too many times. Um, I've proven my lack of rhythm when I do it. Um, but we kind of and I act out the story. But um, Elijah, he's just not afraid, right? I mean, and at this point, we would not have mentioned Elijah as being gentle. But yet he is. He's a fierce warrior. But on the other hand, um, God also allows another type of experience to befall Elijah and teach him something about godly character. Right after this takes place, um, after the false prophets are killed, there is a queen, Jezebel is her name, 
And after she hears about Elijah slaughtering the heathen prophets and seers, she swore out a warrant for Elijah's arrest and execution. When you read about this moment in Elijah's history, and again, you can do a deep dive and read on your own, but all of a sudden, this guy who is so brave and so strong and so daring suddenly seems terrified. He acts like a broken man. He flees for his life. He's on the run for 40 days. He finds himself in 1 Kings chapter 19. Somebody read verses 1 Kings 19, verses 1 through 8. As he finds himself at Mount Horeb, where he seeks refuge in a cave. 1 Kings 19, 1 through 8. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if, this by, time, if, this, if by this time tomorrow I do not make you your life like that one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better, better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled forty days and forty nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. See, God has Elijah, and Elijah is now on the run. Uh, keep, go ahead and keep your Bible open there. We're going to read verse 9 and 10 in just a second. Um, Elijah has said he has been zealous for God, uh, he has done his best, uh, and he is just worn out. He gets under a broom tree, and, and he basically is praying to die. Read verse 9 and 10 now, please. There he went into a cave and spent the night, and the word of the Lord came to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very jealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. Elijah is wiped out. Now, I mean, in our lives, I mean, we feel the same way sometimes, right? You, you, have, been, you have been in the midst of a battle. You have done uh, your time. You've done your share. You've been faithful. Um, you have worked hard, uh, and you feel like that God and His infinite wisdom ought to cut you a break. You ever felt that way? You ever felt like He's been piling on? You did your part, let somebody else do their part. I mean, God, all of a sudden, Elijah is in a world of hurt. He is in a mess. He is on the run. He is afraid he's going to die. He is a broken guy. Uh, the angel has to show him and remind him to eat. Um, and the angel comes down with manna from heaven, which looks like a moon pie. And, um, and, and Elijah is now in this cave. God says, why are you here? What's wrong with you? Uh, Elijah basically winds back to God. And then... God tells his servant to watch. Now, if you keep reading the passage, you see three powerful displays there. A fierce wind rips the boulders from the mountain. Then a mighty earthquake shakes the land. And then third, a fire suddenly flares. And at various times, God has used all of these things to speak to people. But on this occasion, though, God uses quite a different approach. Then all of a sudden, Elijah hears a still, small voice. And he recognizes the voice, and he comprehends the message. Um, there's a commentator that wrote this, Even God does not always operate in the realm of the spectacular. And God decides to show Elijah his gentle side. And in that moment, Elijah is reminded that God is God. That God is all-powerful, and at the same time, there is a gentle side to God. And there's a time in our life where we have to be strong and bold and loud. And see... When we talk about gentleness, I, I don't want the misconception to be that, um, that there are the reaction to things that are not of God, the, the reaction to things always have to be quiet and calm. They don't have to be. There are times that you have to stand up and you have to speak out and you have to fight. And Elijah is a great example of that. And then there also is a balance to that of 
knowing that when the time then is to be gentle and to be quieter and to be simpler and to be not as loud as boisterous. And, then, and, and, and finding that in your life is a hard balance. All of it comes out of obedience. When you understand that you have the power that you need and you can learn to let God control that and control that in you, then all of a sudden you have the gentleness, gentleness that you need to speak into the culture around you. It's not always easy and you're going to screw it up. There's no doubt about it. There's some times that you ought to speak up and you're quiet. There's other times that you have spoken up and said too much and you should have shut up a long time ago. There's moments in your life where uh, you, you're going to struggle to find that balance, but it is something that is learned. And how do we know that? Because the disciples had to learn. You remember the story about Jesus with John and James, right? I mean, they're out there. Uh, they're in there and they're, they're kind of moving about and all of a sudden they come through Samaria and... Um, and, and they, they, they are picked upon. In essence, I mean, the summary of the story is uh, that they basically are, are made fun of, they are ridiculed, and um, James and John look at Jesus and they want to call down fire from heaven to destroy uh, these folks who have dared to ridicule him, but, you know, in the wake of that, them. Uh, and, and they want to they destroy them. I mean, they want to go back to you know, Sodom and Gomorrah. They, just want, they just want God just to pulverize them. Uh, the chosen did a great job with this because, I mean, Jesus corrects them and then he laughs at them about it and, you know, kind of says, it's a little bit overkill, don't you think, guys? And they, I mean, they laugh about that, which is great um, because it's a lesson. But what it reminds us of, they had to learn. They had to learn. I think... One of the things that, that is most bothersome to me about the way that the Christian community reacts to things is we've never learned to find that balance of how to do it, how to balance out that righteous anger, that righteous indignation, and be able to say things in a way that gets heard. We know when to push, know when to let off, know how to react, know how not to react. And so what happens is we live in a world where the church is stereotyped, and it's not right, by what they're against instead of what they're for. And people think all sorts of things about the church and what happens inside the church. And they make those assumptions, and then we walk outside and we make those assumptions kind of come to life. Now, is that fair? No. Is it fair on either side? No, it's not. But we are the ones that have the responsibility of reaching into a world that needs to know Jesus. Why? Because we're the ones that know Jesus. See, part of coming to know Christ means that we have the responsibility of how we share. Part of coming to Christ is we have the responsibility of how we navigate things. And God has equipped each one of us differently. We have different personality types. We have different uh, emotional balances inside of us. We have different thermometers inside of us where you know, we run it different ways. And so some are better equipped to kind of be that, that person that kind of goes in and kind of blows things up. And some people are better to go in and kind of pick up the pieces behind that. But when we all do our job, it works together for good. When we don't do our job, that means that someone else has to do the work that maybe they're not called to do as well. And then we have to learn to recognize that there are some folks who are better, uh, better to be the spokesperson or better to be that person that's going to kind of push back. And I need to be that person that sits back and supports them. And then I need to flip that around and they need to support me when I'm doing what I'm doing. Finding how we have that controlled power in the world around us is huge, especially in the day and age that we live in. Can't turn on the news without hearing about it. We are, we are battling as a nation over everything, it seems. And you know what? You go, through the, you go through a news cycle, and you know what? And it doesn't seem like you get to the end of the week and there's, there's any new news. It's the same battle over and over again, right? I mean, you know, what, what's changed since yesterday? What's changed since the day before? Anything changed overnight? I mean, we have these battles going on. And people are always picking sides and they're choosing sides. And then you're, you feel like you're forced to choose a side. Here's what I would advise you to do. Choose Jesus' side. Choose the side of Jesus. And recognize that Jesus, in a, in a political world, is not Democrat. He's not Republican. He's not independent. He is simply Jesus. And whatever you are, He is. You make Him. And so then the question is, as you're being that, are you honoring Him? And learning to live our lives in a way that honors Jesus and live by truth is important. Remember, and go to Matthew chapter 5. See, the Bible says that Jesus is gentle 
in heart. And we read in Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 9, an incredible passage commonly called the Sermon on the Mount. Um, somebody read verses 1 through 9 of Matthew 5. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up a mountain and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. Blessed are those who recognize they are spiritually helpless. The kingdom of heaven belongs to them. Blessed are those who mourn, they will be comforted. Blessed are those who are gentle, they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for God's approval, they will be satisfied. Blessed are those who show mercy, they will be treated mercifully. Blessed are those whose thoughts are pure, they will see God. Blessed are those who make peace, they will be called God's children. Blessed are those who are persecuted for doing what God approves of. The kingdom of heaven belongs to them. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, lie, and say all kinds of evil things about you because of me. See, there is a quality of gentleness that is woven all through that. And that's what we have to remember. Uh, and you say, well, how does that look, though? I mean, the, the, the contrast of that is, is, is I, mean, I mean, we live in a world where it's hard to do that, and I know it is. Remember the illustration we opened up with early on the first week where we talked about Dan Crenshaw, the, uh, the guy who, who kind of butted heads with the comedian from Saturday Night Live? You know, again, Crenshaw's one of those guys, I saw him again uh, this week. I mean, when, man, when he is on TV, when he is hitting his talking points, when he is as tough as nails, I mean, he is just boom, 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 boom. And at the same time, that contrast to him is, you know, he cares enough about people to reach into the life of someone who doesn't know Jesus to remind them that God has a purpose for them. You need to hang in there and find that purpose uh, to, to cheer and celebrate his family uh, to the point where that person realizes, you know, this guy, I mean, there, there's, there's two sides to him. Where even the comedian kind of says, you know, you, you're such a good man. Again, that's him fleshing out his faith. I, I, think, I think we get bothered if the world says, well, you know, you're supposed to be a Christian, so you've got to do this, and you've got to do this, you've got to do this. Here's where I want you to hear me very carefully. I don't give a rat's behind about what the world thinks I'm supposed to be as a Christian. I owe nothing to the world. If somebody, Joe Pagan, out there doesn't like the way I'm being a Christian, then Joe Pagan can criticize me all day. And by the way, they do. <laughs> I owe them nothing, but I owe Jesus everything. And so I have an accountability to God for how I respond and how I work in the world around me. So do you. And each one of us are placed in places where we have certain things that we have to do and ways that we have to be able to navigate it. So don't, don't, don't ever allow someone out there who's not a follower of God to go, well, a good Christian wouldn't act that way. Well, who cares what they think? So what? I mean, if they're not a Christian, how do they know how a good Christian will act? What they're wanting is a stereotype. Well, don't be stereotypical. Be different. Make different the normal. So, so what that world thinks of you really cannot be your criteria for how you deal with the world. The criteria for how we deal with the world is what Jesus does within us. And the way that Jesus positions us in the lives of people to be um, whatever it is we're supposed to be. I mean, and he goes, you know, and Jesus goes to the list. Blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the meek, blessed are the merciful, blessed are the pure of heart, blessed are the peacemakers. You say, well, what does that mean? Well, what is, I mean, blessed are the peacemakers. Does that mean you never push back and fight back? No, because you're not called to be a doormat. What is peace? Peace is knowing that God is in charge and the world is under his control. I can rest at peace at night. Now, is there peace in the world? No. No. You know, I mean, what's that great joke? People always ask, what do you want? What do you want? If I want to give you a gift, what do you want? Well, I want world peace. You know, every beauty contestant pageant has said that at some point or another. I like world peace. That's great. But you can't have it. Why? Because you didn't make the world. And you don't set the rules for the world. You have to live in the world. So as much as it's up to you, Live at peace. How do I live at peace? Well, I know that God is in charge. And so as a result, I can navigate the world better. I can be at peace. 
Does that mean anything around me is peaceful? Probably not. Does it mean that I can share peace with others? Sure, they get caught in the wake and they can see. I mean, I don't know. Have you ever been in a situation where you were the one uh, that didn't panic and you were the one uh, that, that didn't go crazy and people all of a sudden started kind of looking at you and they're queuing off you to see whether they ought to be scared or not? Now, I think Brooke, I think Brooke will tell you this. I think somewhere back two and a half years ago during the pandemic, I walked in one day and I said, hey, this is nothing to worry about. But if I ever come in one day and act like the world is on fire and we need to head for the hills and we're getting ready to die, that's the day that you get to panic. Didn't I say something like that? I said, but until then, cue off me. If you get scared, watch me. I'll let you know when it's time to panic. And we never headed for the hills. We never took our survival food and went to the mountains. We never, you know, uh, we, we never loaded up the guns and went all Rambo on anybody. Uh, we could have, but we didn't. We, we, stayed, we stayed right where we were, and we survived the pandemic like everybody else. But I did tell them that because I, because I understand. I mean, you know, and again, that's one of my roles here at church. I mean, that's why we, we, we operated the way we did during the pandemic. That's why we got online as quickly as we could. That's why we never took the week off. We kept streaming. That's why... We asked the band, you know, we don't understand what's going on here, but you guys risk a little bit and come on in here and pull the mask off and let's worship together. And that's why we did that. And, you know, and don't think, don't think that everybody liked it. Now, the band, they were okay with it. I mean, for the band, they'll tell you that was probably, probably one of the best days of the week because the first few weeks, no one was seeing anybody. So we'd come in on a Sunday morning. It was like a party because we were the only people we were seeing outside of our families all week. It's like, oh, there's other people in the whole world. This was great. Um, but don't think we didn't take heat from people, even church people. You guys are up there without a mask. You're sitting too close. You know, I got an email because I had a six-foot stick that I got away from the camera. I was making fun of that six-foot distance. And you know, hearing that two and a half years later, I was right. I knew then that that rule was a dumb rule. And I knew that masks didn't work. And I kept saying that. And people looked at me like I was an idiot. Two and a half years later, I'm not such an idiot now. And I'm a COVID survivor. And COVID is awful, man. We got people in this church right now that have COVID. COVID is a big deal. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But at the end of the day, you don't have to be fearful and you don't have to run for the hills for it. A lot of you in this room have had COVID. You're still here. You're still standing. Why? I don't know. God decided it wasn't time for you to go home yet. There's no hills in Florida. What's that? Because there's no hills in Florida. That's right. No hills. Yeah, I mean, Bloom, Bloom's one of the most recent COVID survivors, right, Jeff? Yeah, look at you. Dude, I called Jeff Bloom. I said... How are you? One day he's like, I got COVID. I'm like, how long you had COVID? He, you know, he's been better for three weeks. He just didn't want to tell anybody. He didn't want to come out. No, 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 he's, he's, he's fine. Uh, just, just feeling good. I mean, he's been through it. I mean, you, you, you deal with it like any other sickness. But you've got to be able to understand that what your place is and, and how, to, how to be able to find that. Jesus says, look, these are the things that you have to do. You'll be blessed if you can do these things. You're going to be blessed if you can make these things happen in your life. And so for us, we have to learn how to take that unique personality that's us and then what I said last week, weaponize our gentleness in the world around us. And so I'm going to give you some practical stuff in the next couple of minutes, this week and next week, about how, we, how do you weaponize your gentleness. And I'm not talking about vague Bible stories where, you know, you have to be like Elijah and call down fire from heaven or you got to go and listen for God in a whirlwind or anything like that. Very specific things that you can do as God positions you in the right way and you have to figure out the time and the place to do these things, okay? Practical, practical, practical stuff. Um, because we are called to care for each other. We're called to touch and change the world with the love of Christ. We talk about that all the time. Uh, gentleness is our secret weapon. So how do we do that? The first one I would suggest to you is simply this. Learn to be a good listener. That sounds like a no-brainer. Yeah. Oh, oh. Uh, it sounds like a no-brainer. But let me tell you about the dynamics of listening, okay? And I struggle with this. I have a feeling you probably do, and you may not even recognize that you do, but you do. How often is it that when someone else is talking, we are thinking about what we're going to say in response? We spend a lot of time when we're supposed to be listening but we're already teeing up a response. And what happens is when you start teeing up your response, you quit actively listening. Because then you're waiting for them to take a breath so you can say what you want to say. We say, well, that's how conversation takes place. Well, <laughs> no, that's not conversation. 
That's you responding. That's you talking. And all the all your, only reason you're listening is so you can talk more. There's a difference when you just listen. And I want you to know that is very, when you start listening, that can really bother people. Because we're very prone to hearing the quick response. You ever been talking to some, have somebody talking to you and you're listening to them? And when they're done, you don't say anything right away? And they get a little irritated? And they almost they take that, you, don't have, you have nothing to say? I said all this, you have nothing? You got nothing? Well, you know, I'm kind of thinking about what you said. I mean, you got to be able to process what's being said. And so your silence sometimes is a, is a good sign of processing, but we don't like that. Why? Because we're such poor communicators. We hate silence. Because when there's silence, we think someone has forgotten to do something. Silence in church is, is awful. Because if I say, let's pray, and you bow your heads, and nothing happens, you're all looking around. Who forgot something? Something broken? Did they fix it? Did they fix the microphone? What's going on? I mean, we're looking around like, who, who, something, something's going on. Because again, we don't, we don't like silence anywhere. But think about this. Next time you're in a conversation, instead of just firing back right away, be silent for a moment. And, and, and watch the reaction you get, because sometimes you're going to get a reaction that you, you, you may not expect, because you're silent. Why? Because you listened. And if you don't say anything, notice how irritated people will get at you when you don't say something back. Because if you really don't have anything to say that's helpful, other than, well, I understand, or that's tough. I mean, you know, they're wanting some kind of a, uh, more from you, but if you don't have it, why offer it? See, that happens when you start listening. When you're not listening, you're always looking to fire back. Guys, I'll throw us under the bus. Guys are ultimately, they, they always want to be fixers. They're always hearing something. Every time you hear something, you're trying to figure out, well, how can I fix this? <laughs> how can I fix this? What's the, what's the solution to the problem? I see that look, John and Kay. I see that look, John and Kay Bush. Um, you know, I mean, because again, yeah, yeah, you, you fix it. You fix it. You just take care of things. Let's move on to the next thing. I mean, that's the way guys are wired. There's nothing wrong with that. That's the way we are. But sometimes you just got to listen. And there's nothing wrong with being listened. We live in a world where everyone talks, but no one listens. When you listen to someone, you're taking an interest in them. And you're giving them an opportunity to say what needs to be said. And by your response, you're able to let them say what they need to say without judgment. See, sometimes my silence does not mean I agree. My silence may not mean I understand. My silence may not mean that I don't have a strong opinion about this, or my silence may not mean that I don't have something that I want to say, but my silence may simply say, I value what you just said, and I'm willing to let that sit without any editorial comment. One of the things I've learned about myself as I've gotten older is I can make editorial comments left and right. Again, I have told you, I have the spiritual gift of snarkiness. I can give you a snarky comment about anything you want. I've always got something I can say, just the way I'm wired. Discipline, and hopefully God, the Holy Spirit, works in me enough to learn, help me learn when better to keep my mouth shut. I don't always keep my mouth shut, but better to keep my mouth shut. Because I always got something to say. But silence really is a gift that you give when you are a good listener. And you have to learn to do that. It's one of the ways that we're good to other people. We just give them the reason to say stuff. And the people that you love most, they should have the reason to say stupid stuff. Because they will. See, the people that are closest to you, you've heard them at their worst and you've heard them at their best. They've done the same for you. You give them the opportunity to do it. Doesn't mean you don't have to talk about it later. Doesn't mean you're gonna have to deal with it later. But I mean, you you can you can let them do it. You don't always have to fix it. 
you do have to learn to listen. Um, so that spiritual gift of shutting up sometimes um, is a great way to be compassionate, but at the same time, it's a great way to be gentle. I think sometimes in the political world that we live in, if we would let somebody go ahead and say what they needed to say and then let it sit for a minute and then ask, would it be okay if I respond? It could change the complexion of the conversation. But, we're, but we want to fight, right? I mean, we all know the talking points. So we're, we're, just, we're just quick to fight. Well, okay, so you know your talking points. So, so then you already know what's going to be said anyway. And we have, we have news networks on that are 24 hours a day that you already know what they're going to say when you turn them on. <laughs> Which is why we never hear any good news. We don't hear, we don't hear new news. You know, when the president got COVID on Friday or Thursday, whatever day they announced it, Friday, you would have thought that was the only news cycle. We constantly wanted updates. Well, here's the update. Sore throat, running nose, doing good. Been vaccinated, been jabbed. I'm going to go stand out where Donald Trump took his mask off so you can see I'm standing out there without a mask. I mean, the political, the political upheaval began immediately, and at the end of the day, the guy's got COVID. He's got COVID. Hopefully he gets better. Hopefully he is getting better. Now, the things that have been said in the aftermath of him getting COVID are just unbelievably dumb. And just, again, reminds you of how crazy the world is. When the White House is asked, well, where did he get it? And they answer, it doesn't matter. Well, it mattered two and a half years ago. Where you been? Now it doesn't matter where the president's been, who's been around him. Contact tracing doesn't matter anymore. No, it doesn't matter now. And so the whole... The whole swirling around the toilet bowl starts again, and you just get ready to start flushing out information. Because again, that's the world that we live in. Learn to listen. Ah, oh, gosh. You know, wouldn't it have been awesome? Say, you know what? The President of the United States has COVID. Can we pause for a minute? Let's pray silently for him. You know, even, even, even if you're a White House spokesman to say, look, you, know, you may not pray to Jesus, you may not pray to God, you may not pray to Allah, but whatever God you want to pray to. You know, the big banana peel in the sky. I don't care. Pray to whatever God you want to pray for. Let's pray for our president that he gets better. Wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't that be great? Why can't we live in a world that way? We can. But it only happens when we are willing to start fighting back with goodness and understand it's okay. See, that just comment I just made would get some Christians irritated because we don't want to call people to pray for, to somebody that's not God. Why not? I grew up in a generation where we had silent prayer in public school. I don't remember a single prayer I uttered on any school day during that silent prayer except if there was a test. Oh God, help me know what I don't know. <laughs> I, I needed miracles so often in school because I failed to study and I needed, that, I needed a miracle for the test. And God, God was good, but you know what? But I have no idea what the person next to me was praying for. It didn't seem to matter. That's okay. Why is that okay? Because I know who I am in Christ and my security is in Him and I have peace. I have peace that will say that three rows over there someone's going to pray to Satan. That's okay. I can handle that prayer. Because that's the argument. Well, I don't know. Uh, I don't want any, uh, I don't know who's people, I don't know who you're praying to. Well, who cares? I don't want the teacher to lead the prayer. I just want the freedom to pray. I wouldn't put that on a teacher. I don't need a teacher to be my child's spiritual leader. I just want my teacher to give me the freedom to pray and respect that. Simple, right? But that's the world we live in. We are very afraid because we're not secure in our faith. We forget how good Jesus has been to us and we somehow have not allowed that to kind of flesh out around us. And so as a result, we get nervous. Be a good listener. The second thing is be empathetic. Be empathetic. There's a difference between being sympathetic and empathetic. Being empathetic means that you have to put yourself in the other person's shoes. It doesn't mean that you have to have been to jail or poor to understand the plight of those experiencing it. It doesn't mean you have to be disabled to understand the disabled. Because if you're not disabled, 
you can't understand it fully, but instead you understand the other person's feelings. You try to get on page with that. Being empathetic starts with listening and it ends with seeing the world through another person's eyes. Sympathy is just feeling sorry for somebody else. Big difference. Sympathy and empathy are two different things. Um, feeling sorry for somebody else without trying to understand, that's sympathy. If you're going to show compassion and gentleness, that happens when you're empathetic. That happens when you're willing um, to, to, in some ways, take on that burden and at least see long enough, far enough to know how you can best respond. Nothing wrong with that. That's what Jesus did. Every person that Jesus met, Jesus dealt with as an individual. We like to deal with people as subgroups. We like to deal with people in groups. We don't like to deal with people as individuals, but yet, Everybody that you meet is an individual. They come from a different background, a different story. How I have to relate to each one of you, how you have to relate to me, is just different based upon our life experiences and where we've been. And it's okay. What's easy for me may not be easy for you. What's a struggle for you may not be a struggle for me. It's all right. Doesn't mean that I can't empathize with you, though, because I understand what struggle is. You know, I have a different struggle. Doesn't mean I can't feel for you. You just might have a different feeling. But I can understand that. And here's the magic of that. When you do that, and there's someone who's willing to do that back to you, then all of a sudden you can relate and have a real conversation and do life. Now, if they don't, if they don't want to respond in the same way, if they don't want to respond to that, if they don't want to um, engage that, then you know, that's their problem, not your problem. So you got to remember, when you're called to be, called to be, reach into the lives of people with goodness, that has nothing to do with how they respond. Your success has nothing to do with what they do. If I decide that I'm going to be good and kind to Jeff Bloom, and Jeff Bloom tells me, you know what, go pound sand, man, I don't want to talk to you today. Okay, that's, I'm not going to like it. That might hurt my feelings. But at the end of the day, it doesn't change the fact that I was supposed to be good. I did what I was supposed to do. How Jeff responds is just icing on the cake. That's just a, a check mark in the box. I mean, Jeff liked it or he didn't like it. I did it right, I didn't do it right. But I was trying to do the right thing. I mean, we, 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 base, we tend to base our relationship successes on wins and losses. If it goes the way we want, we get our win. If it doesn't go the way we want, we, we lost. But this is about relationships. This is about relating to the world, touching the world. It's not about wins and losses. See, you're already on a winning team. Jesus wins. We know how the story ends. So you're not a loser. So there's nothing that anyone should ever be able to do to you to make you feel like a loser. So as a result, you can share goodness and you can share kindness and you can be empathetic. I'm discovering the older I get and the more time goes by uh, that I have the ability to actually feel more for other folks because, you know, you, you just slow up and you understand life better. Gosh, sometimes that's half the battle. That's the beauty of wisdom. Uh, I, I talked to someone who, and I'm doing a conference, you can pray for me coming up, where um, the title of my, my particular study is um, wearing skinny jeans and having a tattoo does not call you to be a pastor. Okay, that's the title of my conference. Um, and, and, and so I'm, I'm, I'm talking about, you know, uh, I'm talking to some church planners, and, 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 um, and one of the things I'm going to say to them is, you know, for the love of God, please quit telling people how hard it is to plant a church. I've been there. I've done that. It's hard work, and everybody in the room understands that, and no one feels bad for you because if you're called to do it, you're supposed to do it. Now, so, so I'm going to say that to them, uh, which they'll love, I'm sure. But the other thing that I'm going to say to them that I really do believe is true because this is something that really is burning within me is, oh, my gosh, God forbid that the leadership of the future of the church is with the skinny jean tattooed pastors because they know nothing. They haven't done their time. They haven't loved enough. They haven't been hurt enough. 
They haven't been down the road enough. See, the complexity of the kingdom of God, Jesus created us as a family to be a multi-generational place that can relate. We live in a world where people are looking for sexy churches. Right? Ah, the church is sexy. I can rattle off the list of sexy churches in town, and here's what the deal is. Find me in 10 years, those sexy churches won't be sexy anymore. Why? Because they'll get old. Most of them will be out of business. You know, the beauty of being at it as long as we have is that we've actually outlived most of the sexy churches. Sexy dies when you turn on the light and look in the mirror. <laughs> uh, so, um, that, that was actually a better quote than I thought. That's not my notes. Someone write that down somewhere. Remind me of that later. I'll use that somewhere. Um, I, actually, I like it. Gosh, I, yeah, yeah, I, I can't, I can't. Somebody, what did I just say? Sexy dies when you turn on the light and look in the mirror? Yeah. Yeah, sexy dies in eternal light, look in the mirror. You can quote me on that. Make a meme out there, Mark. Do a handle that for me, will you? Um, we'll see that. I'll get email. Um, gosh, I don't even remember what I was saying now. Wow. Multi-generational church. Yeah, multi-generational church. Um, being a multi-generational, thank you. Being a multi-generational church is really the, the way that God has created us where we're healthiest. When we release the reins to that, and we, and, we, and we give the reins to the, the inexperienced dogs pulling the sled. Uh, the sled goes over the cliff, and we lose the culture. Case in point, the church has continued to lose ground over the past few years, and we're continuing to lose ground. And for the first time in American history, more people identify as non-Christian than Christian. Every major denomination is on the decline. Scandal plagues the church. People have decided they didn't need the church. They'd rather do church online. They're not going to come back to church after the pandemic. Don't kid yourself. The church has taken a few shots. One of the reasons the church has taken a few shots is because of poor leadership. Because we've convinced ourselves that all it takes to be a cool leader is put on a pair of skinny jeans, get a tat, wear the right tennis shoes, and you're in. I can say that as a guy that never kind of went with the trends. I never got haircuts. Didn't put on suits. Wore my tennis shoes when everyone else said I'd wear dress shoes. <laughs> nope. Uh, I do not. I do not. I do not. Um, and I, I, have a, I have a rip on that too, but I won't say it. Um, but um, uh, I have no tats. And, um, and you know, I, I'm... Because I, I, I never wanted to mess with perfection, but neither here nor there. But, the, uh, but at the end of the day, the, 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 uh, the call of Christ is so serious and so important and so all-consuming that when we do it and we do it well, um, we recognize how much we really do need that balance, how much we need each other. We're trying to be trendy, and we're trying to be cool, we're trying to be hip, or whatever the word is of the day. Uh, you know, you, you find yourself in a cycle that you just can't win. Goodness wins out. At the end of the day, the differences melt away. You know, uh, I'm going to tell a story, and we'll wrap it up on David's dad. David's dad, Jerry, and you guys all know Jerry, or most of you know Jerry. Jerry Tyndall, uh, at one point, looked at me, and it's been a number of years ago, and, you know, and, and, and Jerry, Jerry looked at me one day and he did he was, I would be mad at you. But I love you because you're good to my kids. Because Jerry and I didn't have a whole lot in common. In fact, we loved Jesus. But I mean, we, you know, we, we did life, we did a lot of years together. But, you know, but I was not Jerry's cup of tea when I first got to Longwood years ago. And then I wasn't always his cup of tea along the way. But Jerry loved me and they trusted me because I always I had the credibility because I poured my life into his kids. And Jerry knew I loved him. The goodness part, that goodness wins out. So you got guys that are very, very different, but yet very much alike in some ways. Why? That wins, right? That's what makes, that's what bridges the gap. That's what makes us who we are. That's what allows us to be family. That's what allows us to do life together. That's what creates and ties us together. That's what we have to have. If we don't have that, then we got nothing. And so, hopelessly, we're stuck in this thing, and together we have to get it right. Now, we'll keep talking about this, because I have more on my list. But, um, I just saw something. Yeah. You got enough hair to wear a man bun. Did you know that? I did. <laughs> I did. I, but, you know, but as long as you've known me, I've never had a ponytail, have I? No. No, I have not. I've never worn a ponytail. 
And you know why? Because, because you know what? I just don't, I, I just, I, I just can't. I don't think it's of God. Neither here nor there. I just don't think it's of God. All right, let's pray. God, you're good, and we love you. Amen. All right, get out of here. We gotta open up.